Good morning and welcome to Hebron Christian Church. I'd like to welcome those gathered here this morning and certainly welcome those that may be watching online via live stream. There are prayer request cards available at the door and you may also give, uh, submit a prayer request online through our website. So if there's someone out there that you believe needs our prayers, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, also, we continue to ask that for those giving, um, you may text at 84321. There's an offering box at the door. You certainly can mail your check to Hebron Christian Church. Um, this helps continue the work of Hebron Christian Church, not only in this community, but throughout the, throughout the community and throughout the world. So we certainly give you thanks for those that uh, are giving and ask that you continue to give in one of those ways. Are there any announcements that anyone would like to share this morning? Seeing none, I'll turn it over to Pastor Tina as she has an announcement. Thank you, Clifford. Well, good morning, church. So we just wanted to bring your attention to one of the flyers that you received this morning. Uh, this is our... Uh, our church is presenting a kids fun fest this summer um, and our desire is to just kind of reach out into the community to show God's love in a practical way. So uh, we wanted to uh, let you know the date of that is July 24th from 11 to 2 p.m. And here on the flyer is different ways that you can participate. We need help in lots of different areas. And so it kind of spells out for you uh, what uh, it is that you can do as a congregation to help. Those in our live stream, if you'd like to help out with this event, uh, please connect with us and we'll let you know how you can help as well. Um, and then on the back, front is info. And then on the back is um, for you to go ahead and sign up if, if you wanted to take part in any of those opportunities. And if you can just either drop this in the offering basket or if you can... Uh, hand that to me. That would be wonderful, uh, but we are excited as a church to be able to offer this opportunity uh, in our community. So uh, that's what I've got. Thank you, Clifford. Back to you. Thank you. Let us go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity to gather here. We thank you for the opportunity to maybe be at home in the comfort of our own space and watch via live stream. Whatever the case, we give you thanks, O oh Lord. We thank you for being a part of this and certainly helping us, helping us to receive the word this morning from the pastor. We give you thanks on this day, dear God, for our independence. July 4th, the day we celebrate our independence. We also give you most thanks, God, for the dependence we share with you. We know, Lord, that days come and days go and things happen, sometimes things that make us happy and make us proud, and sometimes there's things that happen that we, we may question. But we know, Lord, that we are dependent upon you, and if we're not, we should be. We know, Lord, that everything that happens happens for a reason, and we just give you thanks and praise that we have you, that we can come to you, and we, we can depend on you, because we know through you all things are possible. We give you thanks, O oh Lord, for everything. We give you thanks now, and join us as we say the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Independence has never been easy. Nearly 250 years ago, it was something worth fighting for. The idea of a people who stood on equal footing, free to speak, free to wander, free to live. These were ideals worth risking everything for. 
Today, we find ourselves fighting old battles, not with past foes, but with ourselves. We are a nation divided, divided by skin, divided by opinion, divided by hate. It seems the very freedoms we once fought for have become stumbling blocks. Are we too busy seeking ourselves to even recognize the tragedy which surrounds us? Do we no longer see the profound need for the hand of God? In this moment, the truth of scripture rings especially true. If we, the people, will humbly pray, turn from wickedness and seek his face, then he will hear us, he will forgive us, and he will heal this land. Today, may we remember this one simple truth. True independence is found only in our dependence on God. Well, church, it is a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Today, we celebrate Independence Day. We celebrate because of what happened in 1776. Thirteen colonies and 56 representatives met with Congress and declared that no longer was America adjoined to Mother Europe. No longer would we be under her rule. Thus, the Declaration of Independence was drafted, the document from which the Bill of Rights and the Constitution was taken. And the second sentence of the Declaration of Independence says this, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are allowed, endowed by their creator to certain unalienable rights, that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And as a nation, we have discovered that no freedom comes at a cheap price. I just want to reflect for a second on the price that these founding framers paid for freedom. Of the 56 representatives who framed the Constitution, five were captured and tortured by the British before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned to the ground. Two lost their sons in war. One had two sons captured. Nine fought and died from wounds or hardships of the war. Carter Braxton of Virginia, a wealthy planter and trader, saw his ships swept from the seas by the British Navy. He sold his home to pay his debts and he died in rags. Thomas McKean was so hounded by the British that he was forced to move his family almost constantly. He served in Congress without pay and he died a very poor man. Thomas Nelson's home was seized by the British at the Battle of Yorktown and used as a command post and Nelson urged General George Washington to open fire on it. The home was destroyed and Nelson died bankrupt. You see, freedom is not free. And we learn throughout history that standing up for freedom will cost you something. And as we look throughout scripture, we see that spiritual freedom costs something too. It cost Jesus his life. That his blood would pay the sin debt of the world and give us true liberty. You see, freedom is not free. Freedom comes at a great price, and yet we have stood by powerless time and time again as our freedoms have been compromised. Our enemy, the devil, is very much at work in our nation, seeking to bring division and conflict where we need unity and peace. And in many ways, this is a very real spiritual battle that is raging in our nation. And the weapons that will win the war are not the weapons of the world, but the power of God. See, we live in a world where our freedom to worship God, our freedom to speak about the things of God, our freedom to proclaim the glory of God is being compromised every day. And the time has come for the church to arise, for the people of God to say enough is enough and to take back the ground that the enemy is currently controlling. Freedom is costly, 
Winning the victory is costly. And for far too long, we have stood powerless because we refused to pay the price to win the victory. We've refused to live like the people of God were meant to live. We have bought into the world and all of its ways, so much so that the habits of a born-again Christian are nearly identical to the habits of those who do not know Jesus. We have a war to fight. And that battle will not be won by a powerless people. That battle will not be won by people who are complacent and go through the motions week after week without ever letting the word of God and his ways penetrate their hearts. But the battle will be won. It will not be won by a church that does not hunger to see the face of God and to know him more. The battle will be won by men and women who will run down the road of repentance and pursue God. Men and women who will say, God, I want your will to come and my will to go. I don't want a single thing in my life that will distract me from the purpose that you have called me to. You see, God is weary of being second place in our nation and in our lives. And we need a new passion for the things of God, a new way of thinking that leads to a new pathway of doing See, God calls us to draw near to his presence, to seek his face more than we seek his hand, and to go out and change the world around us. And it will cost us something. Our scripture passage for this morning is from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 21. Let me read that to you. Scripture says this. And God spoke these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for The Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do your work, but but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled in fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us for yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. So most of us are familiar with this passage of scripture. It's where we find the Ten Commandments. And we have to keep in mind that this is Old Testament. And when we look at the Old Testament, we start to think about law, do's and don'ts. And we certainly see many do's and don'ts listed here. But we remind ourselves that Jesus did what the law could never do. He paid our sin debt in full on the cross. And and, and we look to these commandments and, and we see not a list of do's and don'ts, but we see through the eyes of grace and truth the wisdom of the principles that a loving father gives to his children. And each one of these principles is so powerful, and and to be honest, I could preach ten messages on this text, one for each of the principles that God's given us here, but But that's not where I want to concentrate our focus today. Instead, I want to zero in on that last chunk of this scripture, verses 18 through 21. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled in fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you 
so that the fear of God will be with you and keep you from sinning. But the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the darkness where God was. So the people of Israel have given us an example of what happens when God's people choose to worship him from afar rather than to draw near to his presence. See, God had led these people into the desert with the desire to see them enjoy the fruits of the promised land. God moved in their midst on a daily basis. God God spoke to Moses and he desired that his people draw near, but the people refused to be drawn into the presence of God. And the people of Israel are not all that much different from the worldwide church today. And that reality makes us a little bit uncomfortable. The people trembled and they drew back. They did not want to hear God's audible voice and they did not desire to stand in his glorious presence because they knew it would cost them something. The children of Israel had seen some of the greatest miracles that any generation had ever witnessed. This was the generation that saw God part the Red Sea. How many preachers do we know that that can split a lake, let alone an entire sea? This was the generation that lived in the desert with God's provision of manna feeding them each and every day. How many ministers do we know that pray and enough bread falls from the sky each day to feed three million people? And the experts estimate that each day enough manna fell to fill two freight trains, each having 110 boxcars. And the people of Israel were not poor. They they marched out of Israel with bags of silver and gold. And they they were not sick. The scripture tells us that not one among them was feeble. These were three million strong, healthy people. They wandered in the desert for 40 years. And in that time, their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. The people of Israel were no strangers to God's saving, healing, miracle working, and delivering power. They celebrated passionately whenever God moved miraculously on their behalf. They danced and they praised God. They were drawn to his miraculous manifestations because they benefited from them. But they were scared and they drew back when God's glory was revealed. Why were the people so comfortable and even excited in the atmosphere of miracles and yet uncomfortable to the point of retreating in the presence of his glory. Well, for the same reason, we do the same thing. Because sin can hide in the atmosphere of miracles, but all things are revealed in the presence of the glory of God. Moses was quick to warn the people, do not fear, encouraging them back into God's presence from which true life flows. He, he, he told them that God had come to test them. Why does God test us? Because he needs to see what's in us? Nope. He already knows what's in us. He tests us so that we might know what's in our hearts. Like each one of us, the children of Israel needed to find out if they feared God or if they were afraid of him. Because those are two different things, you know. See, when we fear something, we treat it with respect. But when we are afraid of something, we run from it. Let me give you an example. I fear fire because I know it has tremendous power. And that fear causes me not to run from the task of lighting a match, but it does cause me to be wise as I light the match, yes? When I'm cold, I draw close to the fire with fear and respect because it warms me up. But if I were afraid of fire, I would draw back. I would be scared to approach, so I would remain in the distance and be cold. Moses feared God. And that fear is what allowed him to enter into the presence of God. But the people did not fear God as much as they loved themselves. They refused to draw close because they were afraid that it would cost them something. The people drew away from the glory of God, but Moses drew near. And they said, they said Moses, you go and talk to God. And you hear from him and we will do whatever you tell us he wants us to do. See, they believed 
that they could keep in touch with, uh, with God without having to deal with the darkness of sin hidden in their hearts. But good intentions do not always produce right results. And these good intentions did not give the people the ability to walk in God's ways. And how many of us are like them? How often do we expect the preacher to go up to the mountain and hear from God for us? And we draw back away from the mountain of God. We're afraid to hear the voice that lays bare the condition of our hearts. We're concerned that if we draw too close, something may be revealed that we want to remain secret. And if it's kept secret, we don't have to confront it. And we don't want to confront what we still enjoy. The people believed they could not afford to have their hearts exposed by the light of his glory, so they retreated to a place where they felt safe. But God's light would have only healed what it revealed if they had chosen to draw near. But they were afraid, and they did not desire change. And the truth is that even in the church, even among the people of God in our day, we would rather celebrate from a distance than draw close to his glory. Now, I don't know if you recognize this or not, but among God's people, among the church, when we throw a party, when we set a time for celebration, the response is widespread. People are excited to be part of the celebration. There are churches all around the world celebrating the goodness of God through praise nights and outreach events and church picnics and Christian conferences, and people are excited for those events. And I am not saying that that is a bad thing. We need those events. We need those celebrations. They help to bring hope and life, and they are wonderful celebrations of the goodness of God. But here's the thing. When the church says it's time for a prayer meeting, People hide under the pews. The response is so often a long list of reasons why people can't take part in those prayer meetings. And really, here's the truth. Every single one of us, myself included, would rather party than pray. Yes? I mean, if we, if we were to really be honest... We would rather choose to celebrate at a distance than to draw near to the one who created everything inside of us because he still knows what's inside of us. He sees beyond that well-constructed exterior and he refines us when we draw near to him. And sometimes we just don't want that much of God in our lives. But in the celebration, he stays at a distance where we are most comfortable with what we think he can see from over there. This is why we'd rather party than pray. We want revival to come to our church and to our nation, but we don't want to have any of our thoughts, habits, attitudes altered in the process. We don't want God to reveal the hidden places in our hearts where there is hate and greed and lust and envy we want the modern-day Moses to hear from God for us and tell us what to do. We want to stay back in the shadows and in the celebrations so that we can be connected with God without having to deal with the condition of our souls. But you see, God desires fellowship. He wants us to draw close and hear his voice. And if we would only let him lay bare the condition of our hearts, he would heal and restore us through and through, for he is the God that is making all things new. This staying at a distance from God, it is a comfort zone. And God wants to invade that comfort zone. It's not the comfort zone of are we willing to walk across the street or uh, across the room to, to shake hands with our neighbor. It is, will we walk with fear into the presence of God, draw close to his glory, and stand in awe of him? That we may say, like the prophet Isaiah, woe is me, I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. 
And just as God said to Isaiah, he will say to us, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. See, church, we need God in every part of our lives. We need to seek brokenness and repentance. We need to say by our actions as well as our words, God, we want you. We need to be the ones to pursue God with all of our hearts, soul, and body. Church, let us not be like the people of Israel, hoping that our good intentions will give us the ability to walk with God. Let us be the ones willing to strip away all the world has put on us. Let us be the ones who will pray without ceasing. Let us be the ones who are consumed by the ministry of reconciliation. Let us not be afraid to be seen on our knees or on our faces weeping before God. Let us be the ones who break the bonds of spirit spiritual comfort zones. Let us be the ones who will set an example for the people of God to draw near to his glory and not to retreat into the hills when he calls. May you and I say, let revival begin and let it begin with me as I draw near to the throne with fear and trembling. Let it begin with me as I fall on my knees before a holy God. Let it begin with me as I point an accusing finger back at myself and say, God, I am not all that you would want me to be, and my righteous deeds are filthy rags. See, it's only when we draw near and seek the face of God that we will see the power and the mercy of the refiner's fire. It is when we admit that we are not all that in a side of fries that God can begin to change us from the inside to the outside. And from the inside will flow praise and worship for our God and love for our fellow man. From the inside will come the burning desire to be reconciled with people and with God. From the inside will come the wisdom to be righteous and the anointing to do righteous deeds. May we be like Moses and willingly walk through the fire of refinement that we may behold the glory of God. See, God is asking us, to draw near. And on this day, as we celebrate our nation's independence, may we also celebrate the fact that we are dependent on Almighty God for all we have and all we do. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. And I believe that God wants us as a church to take another step in intentionally seeking after him. I believe that God is calling us to prayer. And I believe that he is calling us to make a statement in the presence of our brothers and sisters that we have the desire to seek his will and his ways in our lives, yes? So for the month of July, the church is gonna be open during various hours for times of personal prayer and repentance because I believe that God wants us to come into this house and to seek his face. And so at this time, I would uh, ask you to take a look at that second flyer that we handed you this morning when you came into worship. And on one side is a calendar with days and times this month that the church is going to be open for individual prayer. And I pray that you would take advantage of this opportunity to spend intentional time in his presence in this place. And we won't have any programming during that time, just some soft music playing in the background in an open sanctuary. And we invite you to come at any or all of those times that that, uh, your schedule allows for you, just to come and spend time in his presence, away from the the busyness of your day and the demands of your electronic communication devices, and just come ready to seek his face. Bring your Bibles and your notebooks. Bring your earbuds and your personal quiet time music if you want. Bring anything you need or want that will help you seek after the face of God. Pray prayers of repentance for you, for your family, for this country, and press in to the presence of God because prayer changes things. Yes? So we invite you to prayer. 
And then on the flip side of that flyer, you have a declaration of dependence. And let me read to you what that says. It says, on this fourth day of July in the year 2021, as this great nation, which is one nation under God, celebrates its independence, I do hereby declare my dependence. I declare that I am completely and totally dependent on the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am a child of the Most High God. Apart from him, I can do nothing. I declare this day that I am dependent upon Christ Jesus, my Savior, my Redeemer, and my Lord. It is by the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross that I stand saved, delivered, and healed. I declare that I am dependent upon the Holy Spirit to comfort and guide me on my path toward righteousness and holiness. I hold these truths to be self-evident. God is God and I am not. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is the great I am. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the creator of heaven and earth. He is the ever-present help in times of trouble. He is my hope. He is my rock. He is my redeemer. I am completely and totally dependent upon him for the very breath that I breathe. He is God, and at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. I therefore, as child of the Most High God, do declare that I am his and that I will seek after him all the days of my life. I sign this declaration of dependence as an outward sign of the inner work of Jesus in my heart and in my life. Praise be to God. So we would like for you to take this copy home as a reminder of this declaration, but we have a large copy of this that we would like for you to sign if you are not ashamed to make this statement. And we'll add this document to the collection of important documents of our church history. This is a a, a symbol of our commitment to intentionally seek God. And just as our founding fathers got together to sign the Declaration of Independence, knowing that they were doing something huge and that it meant things were never again going to be the same. Maybe the same is true for us. Like them, we don't know exactly what it means or what God will call us to do in his service. It will cost us something. But everything that is worthwhile has a price to pay. And I believe with all my heart that God wants this church and each and every one of us to be even greater instruments of life and change and hope and help. Amen? Amen. So here's how we're going to do this. We're going to roll a video that will last about five minutes. And during that video, we invite you to come forward and to sign your name to this declaration of dependence. And for those of you who are watching on our live stream, if you would like to sign this declaration as well, please just reach out to us via email or text message or Facebook message or website contact sheet. And we will follow up with you for the best way to add your name to this declaration. So when the video ends, I will come and close this message with some prayer. This is for anyone who would be wanting to sign.
our time together with uh, a prayer from the book The God Chasers by Tommy Tenney. It's called The Prayer of Clay and in his book he, he says pray this prayer with your hand over your heart. So will you do that with me as we pray? Father, we thank you for your presence. Lord, the air is pregnant with possibility and we sense your nearness. But we must say that you are not near enough. Come, Holy Spirit, if not now, when, if not us, who, and if not here, where. Just tell us, Lord, and we will go. We will pursue your presence because we want you. Your presence is what we are after, and nothing less will do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I praise the Lord for the way that he has spoken in our midst today. And if he is encouraged or identified to you uh, another next step in your faith, we'd invite you to reach out to us if we can, if we can be of assistance and encouragement. Maybe it's a conversation. Maybe it's a, a decision. Maybe it's information. Maybe you just want somebody to talk and pray with you. And we're here to do that. Uh, that we might help in any way to facilitate the next steps that God has called you to. At this time in our service, we're going to say goodbye to our live stream audience as we here in-house begin to center our hearts and minds on the, on the table. For in our, well, those of you in our live stream audience, we've created for you a communion video that you can access on our website to help you celebrate communion in your sacred space, for it is our custom as disciples of Christ to come every week to the table to remember and to celebrate. And so we've created that resource for you and our live stream audience. And to you and our live stream, we say, may the peace of the Lord be with you.